Welcome to ESSA TV. Lisa Cameron is an empirical microeconomist whose research incorporates the techniques of experimental and behavioral economics so as to better understand human decision making. Much of her research focuses on policy evaluation, understanding the impact of behavioral implications of public policy, with a focus on social and economic issues. Professor Cameron is particularly interested in the welfare of disadvantaged and marginalized groups and the, socio and the socioeconomic determinants of health. Much of her research to date has focused on developing countries, particularly Indonesia and China, and she has extensive experience collaborating with agencies such as the World Bank and the DFAT. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for having the time to um, speak to us. Pleasure. Professor Cameron, could you give us a brief overview of your academic background and some of the past research, research you've done in your field? Sure. So I was going to start with my educational background. Yep. So I started off doing a, I actually started off doing a Bachelor of Science, but I only did one year because I, I was doing physics, chemistry, maths and biology. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do with that? You know, I'll only be able to end up doing research and I'm not interested in research, <laughs> I thought, at age 18. Yeah. And so then I changed to mm -hmm. commerce. I did a, a Bachelor of Commerce uh, with honours in economics and accounting. It was a joint honours. And um, and then I did a then I went overseas for a year, mm. and then I decided to come back and study. And so I did my masters of commerce here at the yep. University of Melbourne. Yep. Um, and at that time there was a whole cohort of people who would do your masters and apply to study overseas. And so oh. I studied, I applied to study in the U.S. and the U.K. And I ended up doing my PhD at Princeton University. Oh, wow. um, and um, after that, I came back and started as a lecturer here at the University of Melbourne. Wonderful. Mm. That's a very long journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems long looking back at it. It didn't seem long at the time. What, but what, made, what made you change your perspective like from science to accounting and economics? Yeah, well, I think I was just very young and I had no idea mm. what I wanted to do. And I thought I didn't want to do research, which is ironic because now I'm doing research. <laughs> But at the time, I just thought I had some friends who were studying commerce and it seemed kind of new and exciting because I'd never done any uh, commerce yes. related subjects. But once I started doing, um, doing commerce, I realized that I wasn't really that drawn to a lot of the subjects, mm. but I did really like economics because yeah. of the human element. Yes. And so I really liked um, the way it examines human behavior and you're trying to understand why people make the decisions mm -hmm. they do and you're trying to um, design, well, it informs the design of programs that seek to improve human well-being. Yes. So that was attractive to me. Can you tell us about some of your ongoing research projects? So I'm an empirical microeconomist. I'm actually mainly a development economist. So I do a lot of research on poverty and inequality. Mainly my research has been on Indonesia and China. Um, I've always done a little bit of research on Australia because I'm based in Australia, I'm Australian, I'm interested <laughs> in Australian issues yeah. and now I've moved to the Melbourne Institute at the University of Melbourne and we have a focus on domestic policy so I'm developing a research agenda in Australia. Mm -hmm. So I'm just starting a project with a lot of other people where we're looking at uh, Indigenous well-being in the Northern Territory and we're oh, okay. going to seek to learn from Indigenous communities who we identify as doing much better than you'd expect them to do in terms mm -hmm. of adolescent well-being, okay. given the characteristics of those communities. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, the, so that's a new and exciting project. Yeah, it sounds very wonderful, especially for the NT uh, research space, mm -hmm. because it hasn't been quite developed. Uh, yeah, I'm, well, I'm new to this field, um, but there are, there are a lot of people, particularly in the area of public health oh, and okay. elsewhere, who've been working on these issues. So. Wow. I imagine I'm going to learn a lot. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And also, since uh, based on your bio that says uh, you are a microeconomist, but mm -hmm. also you spe specifically in behavioral and uh, experimental economics, mm -hmm. um, as you progress to your, to your master, you get more specialized. How do you become interested in microeconomics, specifically in behavioral and experimental economics? Well, so I'm kind of a mix in that I do, I'm an econometrician, mm -hmm. an applied econometrician, as well as a, an experimental economist. Yes. And my interest in experimental economics really 
developed when I was doing my PhD. Okay. And um, we were taught, because experimental economics was very new then, yeah. and there are a very small number of experimental studies, and, and we were um, taught some of them in labour economics. And I knew at that stage that when I finished my coursework in my PhD, I was going to Indonesia mm, to work okay. on um, on my PhD thesis. And so I thought, well, that's a great opportunity for me to go and run some experiments in Indonesia because mm -hmm. 20 US dollars, say, is worth a lot more in Indonesia than in, in the US. And yes. in the US, most experiments are run at, well, it continues to be the case, but are run for relatively small amounts of money. So experimental economics was being criticised yeah. on the basis that it's not a lot of money, so oh. you know what do the results tell you? Because it's only a yeah. small amount of money. Exactly. So yeah. I went and ran games in Indonesia with twenty US dollars to be split across two people, and also then hundred US dollars to be spent across two people. I did that with maybe eighty people, mm -hmm. and um, so that was a huge amount of money, particularly yes. in those days in Indonesia. Mm. And um, so that showed that it didn't really matter if, um, when you increase the stakes. The results were very similar to when you use small stakes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. It's yeah. a very interesting like outcome, and then it, do you feel like? You somehow you knew the results will come in that way. You felt like I didn't know. I you didn't, did, know. Oh, you didn't know. No. Because sometimes I... you feel like oh, we sort of from previous studies on other from other countries, you kind of see that it's more it's more very likely that we'll come to the same result. Right. So yeah. So you will stop. Yeah, I think it, this was stopped. unknown because it was untested. Mm, okay. First of all, I ran experiments with small amounts of money, which was similar in terms of purchasing power to those run in the yes. US and Europe. And I, so I was able to establish that behaviour in Indonesia looked very much like behaviour elsewhere. Okay. And then I increased the stakes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, wow. Yeah, that's and very interesting. Results. Yeah. So um, back to your, um, what you mentioned before about uh, Northern Territory, about yeah. the research you will you'll start um, doing right now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about like uh, that ongoing research project you're doing as in terms of like, why Northern Territory and why you engage into this particular project at the moment? Yeah, I can't say too much about this project because it hasn't oh, quite okay. started. I mean, I yes. can talk yeah. about, I can tell you what we're planning <laughs> yes. to do, but we haven't yeah, exactly. started, oh, okay. so it's very early yes. days. <laughs> but it's, you know, I've, my research agenda is, has been on poverty and inequality mm -hmm. in developing countries largely, but I'm Australian and i I'm interested in contributing to the policy debate here in yeah. Australia, but I feel often that I don't have kind of an evidence base for that contribution. So okay. I'm just interested in um, working on issues of disadvantage and yeah. so forth in, in the Australian mm -hmm. context. So this just seemed a good opportunity to be able yeah. to do that. And with, it's with a team, it's a multidisciplinary team. So okay. we've got economists, we've got data scientists, we've got psychologists mm -hmm. and public health experts yes. and we've got indigenous researchers and non-indigenous researchers wow. so i think it um like it's got a lot of potential yeah. anyhow so we'll, we'll see how it goes sounds yeah. very promising <laughs> yes what interested you to focus your research on indonesia and china in particular out of all the developing <laughs> countries that we have mm -hmm. uh, why specifically Indonesia and China? Uh, so Indonesia, so when I was in Princeton doing my PhD, there was a fellowship that you could apply to, which mm -hmm. would send PhD students to countries they want to study. So this okay. was meant to kind of overcome the problem that economists yes. study all these countries they don't know anything about. Yeah. <laughs> and so I decided I would go to a country that I didn't know anything about <laughs> because it would be new. Yes. And I knew at that stage that I intended to come back to Australia. So mm -hmm. I thought I'd choose a country that's yes. of importance to Australia exactly. and close. Yes. And I didn't know anything about Indonesia. Mm. And I thought, well, that's just really ignorant of me. Yeah. And it's a large country, so I'll mm. go and I'll learn. And it turns out it was a really good choice because Indonesia is not only really large, diverse and interesting, mm -hmm. but also it has really good quality uh, data, oh, okay. which you can access yes. via the Bureau of Statistics, which means that you can and do the kind of quantitative... Love there. Yes, <laughs> I love data. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that re that's the reason. And so most of my work has been on Indonesia. And then in 2008... I was going on sabbatical and, you know, I was thinking it might be good to broaden beyond Indonesia. And also my children were, um, well, they were at primary school. Well, one was at primary school and two younger than that. And the primary school that they were all going to go to was bilingual in mm. Mandarin and English. Oh, wow. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to have to take my daughter out of primary school for yeah. six months 
And she'll miss out on Chinese. And so what's the obvious solution? (laughs) To go to China. (laughs) So I went to China and I started working on China there. In fact, when I was on my sabbatical, I just really spent time learning a bit about the important policy issues in China. I didn't actually do any research on China. But Mm. when I came back, I did um, start working on a project looking at the behavioural impacts of China's one-child policy. Yes. Um, so that's using experiments to measure mm-hmm. behavioural preferences. Yes. Um, and that's with um, Xin Meng at ANU and some colleagues uh, here at Melbourne, who were at Melbourne University at the time. And, um, and so that was great. Yeah, so yeah. that was a very successful project that ended up being published in Science. And we yeah. found that people born under the one-child policy, on average, do look quite different in their behavioural preferences than people who were born before that and who have siblings. Yeah. So we found that people born under the one-child policy were um, less trusting, less trustworthy in these experimental yes, measures, yes. less competitive, more risk-averse, less optimistic and less conscientious. So that created quite a yeah. stir. <laughs> yes, and it's a very, uh, this type of policies, which is significant across like, in terms of like China, this is a large population, mm. Uh, could, you know, uh, change the way demographics play, in, like not just in the short term but in the long term. As yeah, well. so yeah. I had opportunity to read your your paper. Like there was a uh, from from Monash, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, it looked quite something that really interested me. Like it was very uh, impactful. Was like the the level of this policy could affect to millions of people. Yes. And uh, and also the duration of this policy because it could last for like entire generation. That's right. They've changed it just recently, of yeah. course, but even then it's unclear how that will affect people, mm. yeah. And that was um, work, uh, Lata Gangada and who a professor of economics out at Monash was one of the co-authors on that paper. Wow, that's, mm. that's really, really good research. <laughs> <laughs> my, my next question is, a lot of our members will have to decide upon graduation whether to pursue a career in the public or private sector or in academia. Uh, what were the factors that led you to a career in academia? Uh, Since you, before you promised yourself. It's somewhat random, <laughs> right? Because when I headed off to do my PhD, I thought I did not want to be an academic. Mm-hmm. And I envisaged maybe I'd work somewhere like the World Bank. I was interested in that. But then having spent four years doing my PhD in the US, I felt that I wanted to return to Australia. Mm-hmm. And so the most straightforward way to get a job in Australia when you're overseas is to go on the academic job market, which I did. Mm -hmm. And then I got the job at the University of Melbourne. Um, And it's actually, I mean, it's not that I would have preferred a job in the public sector or the private sector in Australia. I don't think I would have. But Mm -hmm. it just kind of was a course of least resistance. Oh, okay. And I love about academia that it's a little bit like being self-employed because you have a lot of um, independence. Mm-hmm. and flexibility mm-hmm. and um, and you can explore issues that you find personally interesting. So yeah, exactly. that's a great oh, wow. side of the job. Yes, mm. something you, you you find more useful or you like the most about academia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I very much like that. Yeah. Great. Um, also, some, a very important question, I guess, for our members is what key skills do you need to thrive as a researcher, empirical microeconomist? Yeah. Well, I think you need to be very much self-motivated because as an academic, although a lot of academics work in teams and almost all of my projects are with at least one or two other people, you do it is still quite solitary. I quite like that. I like getting into work <laughs> yeah. and closing my door and just sitting in my office. So you have to have that kind of personality, yes, yeah, right? Exactly. So that's not going to appeal to a lot of people. Mind mm. you, there is a lot of scope for interacting with people too. So that's... Yes. That's good, but you can kind of balance that as you see fit. Um, I think you need, to be a good researcher, you need to have a lot of attention to detail because Mm -hmm. it's very, you know, very careful work. So you have to have that kind of skill. Uh, Writing is very important. I didn't really realise that until I finished my PhD. But we're just writing the whole time and the ability to write well um, is pretty critical if mm-hmm. you're going to be able to disseminate the finding of your research in a meaningful way that people can understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what other skills, like, for instance, you said, you mentioned before that you uh, 
you are an econometrician as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you think that also is very important as like what you do? Having data skills. How, yeah, how data skills. Yes. Okay. It's, well, it's essential for yeah, the kind of research essential. I exactly, do. Like, yeah. if you want to be a theorist, you don't need those data skills. But more and more, and as more data becomes available, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's important to have data skills in economics. And also, over time, when I first got my PhD, most of the data that PhD students would have used was existing data, like from yeah. I used data from the Indonesian Bureau of Statistics. But as time's gone by, Researchers are more and more often collecting their own data. So also now it's useful to have skills in data collection, so to know how to design surveys um, and how to implement surveys. I mean, in practice, Mm -hmm. most of the time I do that with a survey firm and I'm lucky to work with a very Mm -hmm. good survey firm, Survey Meter in Indonesia, Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned a lot from them. So I've really learned that in the field. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, and especially for developing countries that, uh, well, Indonesia is very fortunate to have a very good uh, infrastructure in terms of data collection, but mm. most countries, like most developing countries, I'm assuming that they're, they are not yes, in the same quite way. variable, that's so right. So it's up, yeah. to, up to people like you, as an econ- uh, economist, that need to collect, have that sort of skills to collect data properly. Yeah, I think that's particularly true in sub-Saharan Africa and in mm. Pacific countries. Yes. You know, well, as woman in economics, how was your experience in pursuing your master's and consequently your PhD in the field? What was the, the vibe <laughs> in terms of like studying or doing your PhD in in um in the US? In the US. Well, I had a very positive experience in the US. So I was at the Princeton University uh, Economics Graduate Program and it was a very friendly friendly environment. It wasn't cutthroat like some universities are known for being very harsh on their graduate students mm-hmm. and for admitting a lot of graduate students and then, and then failing maybe a third or a mm. half of them whereas Princeton wasn't like that Princeton um, I'm trying to think how many maybe there were 20 graduate PhD students in my intake so it's pretty small mm-hmm. but they target the number that they that they would like to complete the program mm, so it's okay. very supportive and the professors were by and large pretty um, accessible yeah. uh, and they we had a bagel morning tea. Somebody left an endowment to the economics department to fund bagels at <laughs> 11 o'clock every day, <laughs> bagels and cream cheese. So that was very collegial. Yeah. So the graduate students would go to that too. Yeah. So that was all very good. So so really what I have found as a woman in economics, there was there were some issues in that year because there was somebody from the deep south in the US who didn't think women should have been allowed to go to graduate school. Mm. And he was very vocal in that view, but he didn't do very well in the <laughs> PhD program and the women did rather well. So mm-hmm. I think we just can forget that issue. So, but I, I, in my career, I found that really the challenges that women face at least that I have faced, have developed later in my career. Mm-hmm. So when you're younger and, there, and, you know, even when I was first a lecturer in the uh, Department of Economics at Melbourne Uni, there was still, although there, it would have been majority male, by, you know, by large amount, mm-hmm. there were sufficient young female um, academics to create a very collegial environment and very, we were very supportive of each other. Mm. And we've all, in that cohort of about five or six female economists, we've all done very well in terms of our careers. Um, and so that, so that was actually a very nice time. I think it's as you, as, you know, as a woman, particularly once you have children, that it becomes a lot more challenging, yeah. right? Because particularly in academia where people are assessed on the quality of their output but also the quantity you know, there's a lot mm-hmm. of counting of how many articles you've published yes. so if you have children and you take maternity leave mm-hmm. and you might work part-time mm-hmm. for a period then that affects your output and I think universities are still grappling with how to um, deal with that yes. when it comes to promotion and mm-hmm. so forth and I do think that uh, the situation is improving for women but I do think there's a way to go mm. well that's great um uh, Another question related to that mm-hmm. is, what advice would you give to women that are either studying economics or thinking about studying economics? Uh, well, I would say to go for it because I think it's very important to uh, attract more women to the field. Mm-hmm. There's quite a bit of research that's looked at women in economics. There's been a lot of um, attention paid to this recently. Um, there's a lot of evidence of discrimination against women in economics, particularly in academia, 
And um, some of that research shows that women are more likely to uh, research around what is defined to be the edges of the field because mm -hmm. the field has traditionally been defined by male economists. Yes. And women, you know, generalising, can have different um, interests. Mm -hmm. And so then when it comes to assessing women's research contributions, because they're not kind of smack bang in the middle of the defined yeah. field, you know, women can be um, disadvantaged because of that. And so I think the more women that are attracted to the field, the more um, representative the field will be of the general population, yes. which will be be great for the field. Mm -hmm. And it will also mean that the, um, the definition of what is viewed as core economics changes to reflect the views yeah. of men and women. Yeah, that's great. Um, my last question mm -hmm. before we finish the interview mm -hmm. is uh, since you are um, a behavioral economist as well, mm -hmm. what is your favorite behavioral economics concept or something that you, as you progress, you progress in your career, some a concept that you learned or you, you found very favorite uh, as yours um, in behavioral economics? Okay, so I think this is. It's not something that I learned as I went through economics. It's something that I knew oh, okay. independent of economics, which, which has now been reflected in economics, mm. which is that people don't act purely out of self-interest. Okay. So, you know, that was the driving mm -hmm. axiom underlying classical economics. Mm. And behavioral and experimental economics has shown that people actually do have social preferences and they are concerned about the well-being of other people, not just themselves. And you can see that. We demonstrate yeah. that in experiments. Mm. And so I think that's a very encouraging finding. Yeah, that's great. And it shows, you know, a very positive development in the field. Mm. Yes, and also helps us to break that, those assumptions of, you know, more class Yeah, economics. and make economics more realistic. Yes. Oh, that's great. Well, that was a really wonderful answers and um, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks.